So that's why uh, we have to use um, that size. Here you see the subretinal hemorrhage. Uh, we only do the surgery if the hemorrhage is less than one week old. And this is the, the, the tool that we use. It's, it's from Dork. And it's a uh, 41 gauge needle, which uh, can be extended from a 23 gauge shaft. Uh, we have connected the needle to a, uh, a silicone oil, oil pump. In the syringe is not silicone oil, but is a solution of TPA. And I'm injecting this TPA solution through the retina with this 41 gauge needle. It's a very small hole we make in the retina, so it will seal afterwards. What I'm doing is um, injecting in the lower area. This image is, of course, upside down. Um, so we create some space in the lower area uh, of the retina. And the idea is to displace the liquefied blood into this area uh, in, the, in the lower region. So we do an air fill at the end. And when the patient will sit up, uh, it is the idea that this blood will be disposed downwards. And this is illustrated um, here. Uh, this is a drawing of um, the back of the eye. And the idea is that uh, we make a blab indicated in blue um, of retinal detachment and that the TPA in the solution lyses the clot. And when we inject an air bubble, when the patient is sitting up, the air will push down the fluid. Um, and when the fluid is pushed down, it will uh, liberate the uh, scar uh, or the neovascular membrane, which can then be treated with anti-VGF. So this is a typical result that we get uh, with this pro procedure is to displace the blood away from um, the retina. Uh, we already published a study uh, with this technique in 74 patients um, in Acta Ophthalmologica. And um, in this study, about two thirds of the patients had increased visual acuity and one third had either um, no improvement or uh, some worsening of uh, vision. So this is not a very high end technique. It's some, but it's a very simple technique actually, which is a very um, uh, short um, surgery. Um, you can easily do it under local anesthesia. Uh, and it's really helpful uh, for in such cases. Okay, that was um, an opener. Now let's get to some more serious work. Um, this case uh, is a case of an intraocular foreign body and I've indicated it's a small one. It's actually a 20 year old male patient who was um, in the middle of a bomb explosion in his home country, which is uh, Afghanistan. And uh, he came to us um, uh, with a complete opaque uh, lens in his eye. And when we did an X-ray, uh, it shows here that there is a metallic foreign body rest resting in the retina already quite some time. The vision was hand movement, so it was not clear to us if uh, there was already a lot of siderosis, uh, if we could still save some vision, but we wanted to go ahead anyway. The patient had uh, brown eyes beforehand, so that also was not an indicator to see if the patient had already uh, siderosis or not. In the surgery, of course, we started with uh, the cataract surgery. Uh, I'm making my standard 2.0 milliliter, inc millimeter incision. This is a young patient, so it was very easy to remove the lens by manually. Um, the surgery is done with the Doric EVA system. And uh, because the capsule um, was intact, uh, I could even uh, insert um, a plate IOL in the back. This is my standard IOL. It's, it's a Zeiss lens that I use uh, in these cases. So when we did the vitrectomy, it was very easy to find, to locate the intraocular foreign body. Um, and when I scanned with the IOCT over it, as you can see here, I saw that there was some connection between the foreign body and the retina. So I was afraid if I would just grasp the foreign body that I could, would rip um, open or detach the retina. So what I, what I decided at that time was to use an endocautery and to cauterize and actually uh, remove in that way the retina um, around the foreign body. So I'm using a very hard, very harsh coagulation. 
which actually um, removes the retina around um, the foreign body. I scanned again and I could see that there was no connection anymore between the foreign body and the surrounding retina. And then I needed to grasp it. Now this was, um, for that purpose, I used a kidney stone extractor. This is something which you can find in your renology uh, uh, department, renal department. Um, it's um, a 20 gauge instrument. It's way too long. It's one meter long, but it doesn't matter. You can have it operated by your assistant. And so uh, I'm now uh, holding it in my right hand, this instrument, this basket. My assistant opens it slightly. I'm moving in the intraocular foreign body. Uh, and when it's uh, in the basket, I ask my assistant to close the basket. And that way it is grasped very tight into this instrument. And you can remove it safely without having it dropping down again on the retina. Um, this is a technique, an instrument, which is a non-ophthalmic instrument, but it works great in these cases. After removal of the foreign body, I'm coagulating uh, further the, the bed where the uh, intraocular foreign body has been sitting. And um, this is again the intraoper interoperative OCT. Uh, out of safety, I uh, added some laser around the area of extraction and I filled the eye with um, air at the end. And actually, uh, it turned out that um, the result was quite favorable. Um, I will show you what the image looked like afterwards. Um, the patient had a vision recovery of 0.9. So um, the body apparently was not uh, iron, it was brass. And that's why it did not cause acidosis in the eye and the patient had a very good result after the surgery. So a small um, intraocular foreign body. But sometimes we also have to remove bigger ones. And this is uh, a case with definitely a bigger foreign body, as you will see in a moment. Um, this is actually a male patient who was at that time 20 year, years um, old. And he told us that uh, somebody threw a broken glass at him. He could not remember the details. Um, I think he did not have enough blood in his alcohol uh, to still remember what actually happened. Um, but anyway, uh, he was uh, seen by a local ophthalmologist who found that he had a very severe corneal uh, perforation, uh, which was sutured in emergency and the patient was referred the day after to us uh, for further follow-up and he came in with the visual acuity of light perception. And this is the, the surgery. So you see this uh, cornea was already sutured and something very unpleasant happened at the beginning of the surgery. Uh, you will see I've in already installed the infusion but when I installed the first uh, instrument cannula, this happened. Um, this is one of these uh, holy crap moments. First, I thought it was vitreous that prolapsed, but um, you will see in a moment that actually it's his lens that came out. Um, when I'm touching this uh, prolapsed tissue with the instrument, you'll see that this is not vitreous. This is um, a clear lens um, in a 20-year-old uh, patient. So this is definitely a clear lens extraction. I uh, took the vitrectome and I uh, did some vitrectomy in the um, open wound to remove any prolapsing vitreous and I started re-suturing again. Um, Tenno nylon is not my favorite suture but uh, anyway uh, I managed to close it again and so I could finally start with the vitrectomy a long time later and I found, found in the eye a quite large piece of glass. Um, of course, the image is not so well because we have blood floating around in the eye. And again, I used this kidney stone extractor instrument, the basket, uh, in order to grasp it because I don't know of any other instrument that would uh, be big enough to hold it. So we open it now a lot more than in the previous case. And I'm using a chandelier illumination and the twin light. Um, and I'm using a second instrument to bring it into this loop. But now the question was how to extract it. So I decided to open again the wound, cutting all the sutures that uh, I carefully placed there. And uh, through that uh, entry wound, 
I inserted um, a needle holder because that gives you enough grip to grasp the foreign body. And so I handed over the foreign body, the piece of glass into this needle holder and I'm releasing now the, the loop. And um, it's incredible how large this piece is and did not make a bigger wound in the eye than there already was. So it was, yeah, that was the size of the piece of glass. And so I could start suturing again with 10 on island third time uh, that this wound was sealed. So again, half an hour goes by and we end up with a um, closed uh, cornea. I'm now uh, inserting cannulas in the eye to make the eye watertight and I'm doing finally the vitrectomy, carefully shaving in flow mode now with the EVA, the vitreous base. Um, and uh, this is followed by an injection of air first. Um, the retina was still attached. And um, in the end, um, I think we injected out of safety uh, silicone oil, um, yeah, silicone oil in the eye, uh, which I usually do in, in trauma cases. And so we could uh, close the eye after the silicone oil was injected. We did end up with uh, an eye with a visual acuity with counting fingers. Um, but um, we thought that the main factor that uh, made his visual acuity so bad was actually the corneal scar which has formed. And so I referred him to my co-workers from the anterior segment surgery who did a very nice corneal graft, which you can see here. And we have a visual um, acuity now of 0.2 in this patient. He also has a, uh, art, an um, artificial iris uh, in his eye. I don't think, I think this is a pretty good result uh, considering the size uh, of the trauma that has been uh, done to this eye. And then we go to the next case, the case of a retinal fold. Uh, this is a typical example of how not always surgeries go as we like it. This is um, again a young patient, a male patient, 27 years old. And um, in September 2016, he had a uh, blunt eye trauma. Um, he came to us, referred rather quickly. Um, and at that moment, he still had uh, corneal edema because of the trauma. We did some uh, imaging um, of the eye, uh, which I will show you here. And um, this shows uh, an opaque cornea. It was impossible to count uh, any endothelial cells. Um, we did see um, a um, retinal detachment in the eye, um, but no um, um, Berlin's edema. Um, so we decided, because uh, he's a young patient, we uh, decided uh, not to do vitrectomy, but to do a buckling surgery because the detachment seemed to be caused by um, dialysis. So we did a buckling surgery with a circular um, buckle on the eye and injection of a gas bubble of uh, 0.4 milliliters. That was October 4. Uh, unfortunately, a week later, he redetached. Uh, so we decided um, not to try the same thing again but to go for vitrectomy with a short acting gas tamponade. That was October 13, but on October 26, he redetached again. So I went in again and um, I found in the upper area um, a full thickness fold. So you see that the retina is really glued onto each other, bottom to bottom. Um, I didn't want to leave it that way. So I was thinking during the surgery, how can I manage this best? And um, maybe there are different approaches. I'm looking forward to hear any other ideas from your part, but I will show you how I solved at that time the problem. Um, I injected a small uh, bubble of perfluorocarbon liquid. And then I used this uh, membrane dissecting spatula. It's um, actually designed from Grazia Pertile. It's, it's produced by Dort. And it's a very nice spatula um, because it has semi blunt, semi sharp uh, sides and a little curved superior surface. So you can, uh, as you see, 
use it uh, here to nicely dissect Lewis the retina. You can also use it um, for dissecting membranes from the retina, by the way, for example, in diabetic cases. And by sliding the end of the instrument in and out, you can really uh, determine the amount of uh, angulation that you want. I continued with a uh, diamond tipped silicone brush uh, to wipe out, to swipe out this uh, fold in the retina. And after that, I continued injecting perfluorocarbon liquid um, to uh, unfold, uh, sorry, to flatten the retina again. And I uh, continued by applying laser. And this was followed by a fluid air exchange and probably injection of gas. Um, yeah, probably it will happen gas. It's in the superior area, so gas uh, should work. And this was the result early after the surgery. And I think I have one more picture. This is the late result. The fold came back partly, but not to an extent that I needed to redo the surgery. And uh, in spite of having had four surgeries, fortunately the patient recovered to 0.7 visual acuity. Okay, so I'm curious to hear from you if you would suggest other approaches. Uh, we will hear that during the discussion after the end of my presentation. But first I will share with you um, another trauma case, actually a very severe trauma. Uh, you may remember that in Belgium, our airport was um, attacked by a terrorist um, in March, on March the 22nd, 2016, um, with um, severe damage and a lot of people getting hurt because it was a bomb, a splinter bomb that contained uh, metallic fragments. Actually, two bombs went off. Um, and I think we treated um, seven or nine patients in our hospital uh, for eye wounds. And this is, uh, this is one of them. Um, this is an, a lady, she's in her 40s. Um, she worked as a flight attendant. Um, and this is an x-ray of her body. You saw uh, in her uh, upper leg uh, and also in her feet everywhere, she was um, having these metallic particles inside of her body. It was really, really, really ugly. Um, this is an ultrasound taken shortly after the trauma of her, uh, of her eye. Um, and this is a closed funnel. So in theory, this is not operable anymore. Um, this shows you the uh, photo of the anterior segment. Uh, there is some siderosis on the cornea. You see some naked uh, sclera, so it's not looking good at all. But I wanted to give, her, give it a try anyway. So I installed an anterior chamber cannula an interior chamber maintainer, and I'm inserting the cannulas very horizontally, not to end up under the retina or under the choroid. I'm inserting the cannulas uh, completely horizontally, and this is one I found. This is uh, a funnel retina uh, with some scars in the funnel and some scars under the funnel. Um, but I figured out a way to get to the inside of the funnel. Um, now, to open the funnel, that's a little Trip, uh, sorry, trick I want to share with you. Uh, I've injected um, viscoat here, viscoelastic, and that's a very handy tool uh, to open a funnel. If you use perfluorocarbon, it will probably end up under the retina with the viscoelastic, and I'm injecting more viscoelastic here. Uh, you can really gently push open a funnel and remove uh, scar tissue. Here I'm using the, the vitrectome um, to remove the periphery of the retina, trying to open this tulip-like um, retina. Um, and somehow I, 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 I couldn't manage it first. So I went under the, um, under the retina. And this is an end gripping uh, forceps, um, which I'm using uh, an Eckert style forceps to remove scar tissue from underneath the retina. Uh, this is just above the optic disc uh, that uh, I'm doing surgery here. And this, of course, had to be removed in order to be able to flatten further the retina. So remember, this is, again, the rear of the retina. Here you see the inside of the retina. Of course, this takes, this is only a montage, which uh, is a three minute video. In real life, probably the surgery has taken uh, more than three hours, of course. Uh, so all the scars seem to have uh, gone now. 
and um, now I will use heavy liquid perfluorocarbon uh, to flatten that uh, remaining retina and uh, a little to my surprise um, it worked. I, I could flatten the retina and I could do a um, exchange perfluorocarbon uh, to uh, silicone oil uh, in this eye and this is how I ended uh, the surgery. And I'm using here again this uh, diamond dusted uh, Tano brush uh, to unfold the retina so you can displace the retina under oil uh, to place it where you want. This is some peripheral retinal leftover and I'm uh, using the uh, cutter to, uh, to remove that um, because it uh, will be ischemic and can cause uh, neovascularization and rubiosis iridis if you leave that. So any uh, peripheral retinal flap um, has to be removed and I'm, um, this reminds me of the days of 360 um, retinotomies in the macular translocation um, how, we, how we did that surgery at that time that was very early post-op um, the retina of what's left of it uh, remained detached and that's uh, one year post-op um, and three years post-op she has some visual acuity, some hand movements, uh, which is of course not functional visual acuity, but she still has her eye and psychologically it made a big difference for the patient that she still has her eye and that she still has some visual perception in there. So I'm really glad and she's really glad that I did uh, the effort. I'm leaving for the moment the silicone oil in, uh, probably um, at some time I will have to remove it, but that's, uh, that's for later. Okay, um, this is a case of subretinal PVR, again a young patient, uh, 18 years old, and he came in uh, because he started seeing um, um, a, a peripheral scotoma in his uh, second eye. For, uh, he had lost his visual acuity in one eye six months ago and he didn't dare telling that to his family. So he came in with a long-standing detachment in his uh, one eye, um, which you see here in the photograph. What you see is sub-retinal scars. Um, you see the retinal vessels uh, lying on top, so it's all taking place under the retina. And in his other eye, he had, uh, but it's just not visible on this uh, photo, um, he had a um, detachment in the lower temporal quadrant. So we decided to do bilateral surgery, doing an external buckling surgery in his right eye in the most acute detachment with the circular uh, buckle. Um, and in the left eye, in the long-standing detachment, uh, I did during the same anesthesia, a vitrectomy uh, combined with encircling band. And it's the latter that I wanted to show you, the surgery in the left eye uh, with the subretinal uh, PVR. So here the encircling band is already um, placed around the eye. Uh, this is the installation of the infusion cannula. I always work hybrid, uh, which means that the infusion cannula is 27 gauge and the working cannulas are either 23 or 27 gauge. Of course, we start by doing a vitrectomy. Um, the retina is still attached, so it's a little tricky. Um, and here I'm injecting uh, perfluorocarbon while holding a backflash instrument in my left hand. This is chandelier illumination and actually it was not so difficult to flatten the retina also thanks to the, um, the buckle that I uh, installed. Um, now I needed to remove the subretinal tissue and uh, for that purpose I'm using the this is um, the dark subretinal forceps. Uh, it is uh, a 20 gauge forceps um, so you need to enlarge your incision and of course you cannot insert it through a cannula that speaks for itself. But it's a very convenient instrument which you can slide through a peripheral retinotomy under the retina, take the subtranal strand and this is how I usually take it out. I use my light fiber um, as um, um, a roller to roll this uh, subretinal strand over. Um, and I'm now approaching it with my left hand. Again, I'm going under the retina through the peripheral retinotomy. Uh, through the retina, you can see the tip of the instrument and uh, that way you maneuver it in the correct position to remove uh, the subretinal strands. Now you see how the retina is being dragged towards the retinotomy. 
so we have retinal incarceration, um, and that's why I'm indenting the eye and uh, doing a peripheral retinectomy. This reminds me of the old 20 gauge days. We had to do it all in many cases uh, because of uh, vitreous and uh, retinal incarceration. Now with these valved cannulas, it's uh, something that doesn't happen that frequently anymore. I'm now taking out the peripheral carbon to um, see uh, how things are evolving. We still have the incarceration, so I have to do more peripheral uh, retinectomy in order to loosen it. Um, and after that, we are, I think, re-injecting heavy liquid. Let me just have the video rolling. Yes, we inject peripheral carbon again to flatten the retina. Now we don't see too much subretinal strands anymore and we don't see any retinal faults, any retinal incarceration, so we can continue by lasering the retina. Yes, there we are. Um, I like this uh, extendable laser, so you can slide out the tip um, to have the instrument uh, always in the same direction perpendicular to the retina. And at the end, we um, injected uh, silicone oil into the eye. Okay, um, as an intermezzo, I wanted to show you a very short video with a practical tip. Uh, when you do trauma surgery, you often have eyes that are completely filled with vitreous blood, with vitreous hemorrhage, so you don't have any pupillary light. And I wanted to show you a little trick if you have to do lens surgery, how you can do the capsulorexis. Because you will do a vitrectomy um, um, after the cataract surgery, you will already have your light fiber on the table. So just in, in, uh, insert your light fiber from the side opening and look how nicely you can see the rexis. So you just shine from the side on the, ca on the capsule with your light and with your uh, rexis forceps, you can grasp the anterior capsule and uh, make a capsule rexis uh, that way. It's a very simple thing to do and you can do it without any pupillary light. Okay, um, and now um, I told you I would show you not your everyday surgery, so maybe uh, till now uh, you're saying to yourself, well, what I've seen till now I've already done in my life. Well, what you're about to see, I guarantee you, you have not done ever in your life. And that's actually um, a new clinical trial I'm doing, um, during which we are um, implanting a artificial retina into patients with end-stage retinitis pigmentosa and, and bilateral blindness. Um, here you see a typical fundus photograph of advanced RP uh, and what the OCT looks like. So the photoreceptors are completely gone. And um, of course, it's, it's rather rare, but we have still uh, quite a few patients with complete blindness because of this disease. In this clinical trial, we're using an uh, implant from uh, nano retina. It's called the NR600. And it actually looks like this. Um, so on the bottom, you have 600 electrodes, which are shown here. The electrodes are coated but the tips are free, that's uh, important. The length of each electrode uh, is, uh, is, is that length which is required to reach the photoreceptor uh, area uh, from the retinal surface. So that's the bottom. On the top of the implant, the implant is four by three millimeters. You see in the center, this black box, which is actually a camera, a CCD camera. And the green boxes you see are uh, photovoltaic cells. Why? Um, because, of course, the device needs to be powered. And the device is powered when the patient wears such glasses. These glasses contain an infrared light source. The infrared light shines through the pupil on these uh, photovoltaic cells, and that will power the camera. So there's no cabling going outside of the eye. There's no need for a battery for whatever. And the device can be switched on by putting on these glasses, which do not contain a camera. They just contain an infrared light source. Uh, and when the patient takes off the glasses, the device stops working again. Uh, this is you know, four by three uh, millimeters. 
And so how does it work? Uh, when you implant this device on top of the retina, the tips of the electrodes will be in between the uh, bipolar cells and they will replace the function of the photoreceptor. So the patient is wearing the glasses, the infrared light shines on the device, activates the device, and the camera will receive the image and generate uh, the necessary electric pulses in the tips of the electrodes to generate an image which is sent to the brain. So actually, um, it stimulates into the deeper retinal surface, but it is implanted on the upper retinal side. So it combines advantages of, of both. It's implanted in the easy way, but it stimulates in the correct way, not uh, on the ganglion cell layer, it stimulates in the deep layers of the retina. So how is this uh, installed into the eye? Um, I've, I've actually collaborated uh, for four years now with NanoRetina to work this out. And uh, we have now a device which contains of two parts. Um, here you have the device itself, uh, as, offer, as I have already explained, and it's fixated in a ring. Here's a second ring uh, with two haptics, which is, which is sutured into the sulcus of the eye. And between both rings, you have these springs. These are actually wires, uh, semi-metallic wires, which um, are uh, curved, as you can see. They, they twist and they generate exactly the necessary amount of force to hold this device into the retina. Um, and so this is how it looks like from the side. To um, install the device, uh, we first attach the haptics into the sulcus and then we lower the, um, the active device into the retina. So let me show you on the next slide. Uh, this is how the device is in the box. Um, so the both uh, helixes as we call them, uh, both uh, wires are folded and the device is held onto the ring that is implanted in the eye. Uh, once this device is sutured in the front of the eye. We lower this central suture, which we call the leading suture, and that's way we can lower the device into the retina. It's actually a very fun moment uh, when you have uh, done all the work to suture this device in front of the eye, that you just grasp uh, the suture and you lower it and it sinks down into the retina in the position that you want. Okay, enough theory. Um, I will show you a video uh, of one of the surgical cases that I did um, in March. Uh, actually, this was the very first case I ever implanted. This patient was pseudophagic, and in order to make an opening to install the device, we need to take out the IOL first. Then we need to do a very extensive vitrectomy with triumph syndrome because we cannot leave any uh, vitreous remnants, of course, on the retina. And now I'm making two flaps uh, on, um, to cover the, um, the sutures. And here I am inserting Gore-Tex sutures, which will hold the device uh, into the eye. Uh, I'm inserting them with one hand and pulling them out with another four shaps uh, outside uh, of the eye. Then I am opening the, uh, the cornea uh, to 12 millimeters. Uh, those of you who have done extra cap surgery will not be surprised by such, in, such incisions. My residents always uh, are very impressed. And this is what the device looks like out of the box. So um, through this large opening, the first haptic is inserted. Um, and when it is inside of the eye, we pull on the lower both retaining sutures. It's, uh, the difficult part here is not to get the sutures entangled. I've practiced it a lot on uh, plastic eyes before actually they're doing it uh, also on pigs we did a lot of testing and now i'm uh, using uh, an instrument an, an instrument to insert the lower haptic and we're also pulling on both switches making a knot and the knot of the cortex is buried under this uh, scleral flap and that holds the device centered into the eye the white suture that you see here is that leading suture, which will be used to lower the device. Uh, now I'm inserting a uh, chandelier. This is the twin light from Dork. We switch on the twin light and you will nicely see uh, how the pupil uh, lights up. 
when the chandelier is switched on. There we go. Um, so now I'm cutting the suture holding the device uh, to, the, to the front. It jumps down halfway. Don't worry, it's only halfway. I'm grasping the leading suture with an end gripping forceps and I can lower it now exactly in the position that I want. Um, and uh, once it's down, um, we say the magic words, the eagle has landed. There it is on the retina. And as you see, no hemorrhage, no drama, nothing. It's completely calm. Um, these are some parts, we call it the bone, that we need to remove um, because it would be in the center of the visual axis. So this is just plugged out, the sutures are cut, and everything is gently taken out of the eye. And this is the end result. Um, the device is sitting there without, um, without any fuss. I'm doing an OCT scan over the device, uh, showing that on the sides, there's no sign of retinal swelling. We tested it in a lot of pigs, but you're never sure, of course, uh, until you do the human surgery and um, it, it was fine. And then, of course, I have to reinstall uh, a sulcus lens. Uh, I'm um, injecting it uh, on top of this uh, ring, which is now sutures in the sulcus. Uh, and that's important, um, not so much for visual acuity, but to focus the light from the glasses that the patient will wear on the device. So we need to have an optic in the eye. And then we suture the eye. Close the eye. It's a three and a half hour surgery. It takes quite some time. Um, and this was um, taken, I think, the day after. No, that was, that was the end of the surgery. And this is 10 days later. You see here how these helix uh, wires come down and push the device uh, neatly into the retina. And when you do an OCT scan, this is just besides the device. There's no swelling uh, of the retina, no hemorrhage. And uh, now we are um, six months later, still uh, it looks exactly uh, the same way. And now, of course, the question is, does it work? Well, only yesterday I received a video uh, which um, we made uh, from one of the patients. We unfortunately had to interrupt her training during the first months because of Corona. Uh, but in, since uh, one month, six weeks, uh, we could train her again to use the device. And uh, this shows you um, what, um, what we have obtained till now. So this is a 60 year old patient. She, has, she had no light perception. She was completely blind. She has been living in the dark for 10 years. So completely no light perception. Um, and now she can, uh, of course, these are very highly contrast um, tests. She can locate uh, this uh, key shaped uh, thing. And you should see the smile on her face every time when she succeeds. Now she has to show what she's seeing. Um, she doesn't speak English and she is showing the English investigator that she's actually seeing a square. So she can even see it's not round, she, she can see it's a square. Now she is asked to follow with her eyes that uh, white line, and you can see she can really follow objects. Um, again, she was living completely in the dark, and now we ask her to to grasp it, and she can she can grasp uh, this object and even touch it and 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 find the edge of the of the uh, of the object. and put her finger on the right side. And we ask her, can you also put your finger on the left side from this object? She only has uh, 12 degrees visual, acute, uh, visual field, so she really has to find it uh, that uh, she manages uh, quite well. And uh, now look again how she's uh, having fun uh, that she can really, really do this. Um, and now we place three different objects um, and she can really find them and locate them uh, with her finger. She's doing a, a great job here. Yeah. <laughs> now we instruct her to follow this uh, line on the floor. You have to realize she hasn't been able to walk by herself in, uh, in 10 years. 
um, and now she's scanning the, the floor and uh, she really can walk um, over this um, white line. Again, she does not, she only has a very limited visual field because the size of the implant is only four by three millimeters, um, but um, she can do it. And um, this is very impressive. She now sees that the line ends and that uh, it makes a bend. And she can actually uh, guide herself in the correct position and continue to follow the, um, the, the, the remaining uh, of this uh, line structure. Um, I'm still uh, impressed, even I've seen this video now a few times. Right, and now she sees that uh, actually the line is ending. And she's following and then uh, it's, it's over. So again, these are patients which it had previously no light perception and this is just after a few months of training. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty impressive. Okay, um, I've shown what I wanted to show. I just would like to end by showing you uh, the new facility we have um, relocated to uh, now two years ago. We have relocated our clinic. Uh, this is uh, the building we have um, moved into. The, it's a completely glass building. We have the, the, the complete top floor is ours, is ophthalmology. Uh, this is the inside of our uh, building. It's actually won a very prestigious prize of the most of the best uh, medical building in 2018. And a year ago, we moved into a new operating theater. Um, we have brand new Zeiss Artivo microscopes. Um, we have uh, four door EVAs now installed. We work now fully disposable. Uh, all instruments we use are uh, disposable. Um, so it's a really pleasure to work uh, in our new facility. I'm really proud of this too. And you see the EVA screen, the Artivo screen, and you see how everybody is working in 3D. I do all my surgeries, by the way, in 3D. I haven't looked through Oculus in, in two years uh, anymore. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope it was uh, interesting to you. Uh, thank you a lot, yes. uh, Professor Salman. Uh, it was really interesting with the uh, wonderful surgery and a lot of tips and tricks uh, for all the audience. Uh, especially thanks for t sharing the last case with the nano retina device. It was really interesting to see the patient and uh, uh, how she get benefit from uh, such surgery. Uh, I would like to open uh, the floor for question. If uh, anyone have any question for Professor Tolman, he can uh, ask it in the Q&A section of the Zoom meeting and we can discuss it. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Stallman. Uh, again, very nice uh, illustration of, of this uh, uh, new device and I hope that uh, it, it helps uh, our patient uh, live a better life. This is a game, really a game changer. Um, I had a couple of questions about the, about your use of intraocular uh, OCT, uh, and I've seen that you've uh, you've used it in, in a couple of uh, foreign body cases, and uh, so uh, my question is is about uh, how how you see now the, the, does it does it help you in, in knowing what kind of uh, intraocular foreign body are you dealing with, and and is is it a very helpful tool, especially that. Uh, a lot of the foreign bodies that uh, that we face sometimes are uh, positioned away from the uh, from, uh, anterior to the equator, so it can be a little bit challenging to get uh, a good image there. Is there any tricks in dealing with those cases? Well, you're absolutely right. You can use the OCT for anything uh, up to the equator, but uh, it doesn't go further than that. Um, I, I don't think the main uh, use of the intraoperative OCT is uh, in, in trauma surgery. Uh, this was just very convenient that I could uh, uh, have an idea about uh, how densely the foreign body was incarcerated to the retina. But the main uh, use of the IOCT is, of course, during macular surgery. 
Um, I often have cases uh, where I wonder if I have a penetrating megalovolin or not, for example, in retinal detachments, and then it can be very helpful. Um, also, in, in diabetic cases with vitreous hemorrhage, where you do not have an OCT before the surgery, you can do an OCT during the surgery and to determine whether or not you have to peel the ILM or inject steroids or whatever. That's the main use of the IOCT. Um, I'm not saying that uh, you really need to have the IOCT to be a good surgeon. It's just something very convenient to have. Um, and and um, I think for corneal surgery, for lamellar grafts, you really need an IOCT. Uh, as a posterior segment surgeon, you're just lucky if you can if you can have one. But um, it's um, it's one of these many things that makes life um, more pleasant. Uh, but it's not something that uh, you should really really have to do to do good surgery. Uh, we have also a question from uh, from Dr. Khaled Septi. Uh, Dr. Khaled, I think uh, you have your hand raised. Uh, the mic is yours. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for this uh, excellent webinar. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate Peter for an excellent surgery. Um, I learned a lot from these cases, wonderful cases. Thank you very much for sharing these cases with us. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, great. I just want to uh, add something about the uh, fantastic case you did, the bilateral detachment with the case with the extensive subretinal fibrosis, which uh, it's a very challenging case, as everybody know. I just want to mention about a technique that I have been doing recently, that I go transcleral instead of creating one or multiple holes to approach these uh, uh, bands. So I go transcleral with single entry, and I put a trocar, which is valve, and I access these membranes without creating holes. So I found these, uh, this approach is quite helpful to minimize the uh, risk of redetaching by creating holes in a cases that you really don't want to create more holes as it may be complicated. So just, I think this is a, co a, a comment I would like, I wanted to share with you guys, and I don't know if you have experience. I have a few videos that I have published at the Academy website where I do a transcleral approach, 25 gauge, uh, with ex even with extensive membranes, you can be more, almost everything and leave the subretinal space free of uh, fibrosis to uh, enable you to put the retina back and have, have a higher success. I wonder if you have any, any uh, experience with that. Well, I haven't tried it, but um, it, it looks attractive and uh, that's actually a very great idea if you have, of course, enough space under the retina which you have in these uh, complete attachments so that's uh, actually a very good suggestion which um, I, I, I would definitely be interested in, in trying in, in such a case absolutely great great thank you dr Khaled. Uh, so um, we have also another question about the, the basket that you've been using in those, in those interocular foreign body i know that uh, that also uh, um, our boss here, Dr. Mora, had some similar experience with, with those cases. And, and I think being in a general hospital, interacting with, with specialists and, and other fields always opens you up for new adventures and, and, and new ideas. Uh, so so um, I've seen that you've used it in that case when you, when you removed the intracardial intraocular for, uh, foreign body from the cornea. And so, so how did you feel? you know, go, uh, dealing with it uh, with another instrument and like manipulating uh, forceps and then with the basket, was it something easy knowing that you have your assistant, assistant opening and closing the basket for you? Well, you only have two hands and of course you need <laughs> one hand to hold the basket and a second hand to, to hold an instrument to move the foreign body into the basket. So you really need to depend on your um, uh, on, on your assistant. So what we first do is before we go into the eye, uh, we practice. So I just uh, move the microscope up and under the microscope, I ask to open the basket, close the basket and do it like 10 times uh, because you really have to, good, have, to uh, have a feeling how much the basket opens in relativity to the movement of your, of your thumb, which operates the mechanism to open and close the basket. 
um, because you can, I think if you open it completely, it's about three centimeters, so it's way too large, it would damage the retina. So uh, this is of course something you use once a year or twice a year, uh, with probably every time a different uh, assistant. So you really, uh, I would suggest to really try it outside of the eye before going in. That's, um, that's a very helpful tip. But uh, it's a very um, um, strong uh, um, wiring, this basket. So once you have the foreign body in it, um, the, the main fear is always when you go outside of the eye through a sclerotomy uh, with, for example, a forceps that you would drop the foreign body back into the eye and it would fall on the macula. And that's something you really want to avoid. And I've never had that happening with the basket because it has four wires. Uh, the foreign body cannot slip out. And even in very uh, sharp foreign bodies such as glass, it will not cut these uh, semi-metallic uh, wires of the basket. So it's a very, very, very convenient instrument. It's just way too long. I think the, uh, the instrument is one meter long. Um, so if a company like Dork could uh, make such a device with uh, a shorter loop uh, that you could be hand operated by the surgeon with, with index finger, for example, it would be more convenient. Um, so um, we've already suggested it, of course, but it's um, with the new MDR regulation, of course, things take uh, even more time than before to um, to make such instruments uh, work and and, and um, to to make them available. I know it's tricky knowing that this this is like a niche market. Maybe not many people are interested in going into. Uh, you know, using uh, constructing a device where, where not many people probably are, are using. You know, we have yeah. only limited surgeons who will take care of those, uh, you know, uh, challenging cases. And I think yes, uh, we're, we're, not, we're, we're uh, very glad to have you with us uh, in that matter. So a question about the nano retina device. Uh, one of the uh, attendees is asking of uh, how is the device fixed on the retina surface? Uh, does it move with the movement of the patient? And uh -huh. uh, was there a reason to implant uh, temporal uh, on the fovea rather than over it? Mm. Um, okay, so what's uh, about the fixation? Um, when, when I started working with nanoretina, uh, we believed that the introduction of 600 electrodes into the, into the retina would cause enough resistance to fixate it in the retina. Um, and that was correct in theory, but was not taking into account that patients do have eye movements which are called saccades. And so when we implanted the device into pigs just like that, uh, without any fixating mechanism, uh, the device came out after two weeks because um, of the eye movement. So we needed to find a way to fixate it in the retina. And um, then we had uh, a tryout by using uh, tax, uh, you know that the um, Argus prosthesis, which is not available anymore, uh, was fixated with one tech into the retina. And so we tried with two techs to fixate it, which worked, but was quite traumatic to the, to the, to the retina. I didn't like it. Um, and so that's why we completely changed gears and uh, went for a completely new solution, which you saw here. Um, so the, the device itself, the retinal part is not fixated in the retina. It just being pushed gently into the retina by these two springs that come down in the eye. Um, and that's how it can be inserted very atraumatically uh, without causing any damage to the eye. Um, why did I put the device in this patient eccentrically? It was by accident. Um, it was not intended, but it ended up there. And uh, once it was inserted in the retina, uh, we discussed about it. I didn't want to pull it back out, 600 electrodes, and put it in another area. So uh, in the other cases, um, we corrected the technique and we were able to implant the device exactly into uh, over the macular area. It fits exactly between the, the large arcades. Um, so that's well, 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 I think this was the, the case with, with the, with the trial, with the cases of, uh, of Argus in our institution as well, because it's always the challenging part of the surgery and you end up traumatizing the retina. It's a very critical high 
uh, intensity step of the procedure. And I think if you can do away without it, it, it would be a much, uh, much easier or, or much more convenient technique uh, uh, that will be adopted by, by more surgeons, uh, I assume, in the future. But yeah. really, con congratulations. Uh, very eloquent surgery, very nice results. And, and we really congratulate you on that. And, and uh, I think that uh, we've, we've basically come up on our, uh, at the end of our time. Uh, and I would really uh, want to thank you a lot, Professor Stalmans, for this uh, very nice presentation, very challenging cases. And uh, it's truly not your everyday uh, uh, surgery. Uh, well, well said indeed. Uh, I would like to mention uh, that um, at this stage of our, uh, our GF, uh, um, we, we are basically ending our weekly schedule and with the return to normal practice in, in Saudi Arabia now, it's, we are moving to uh, a monthly uh, webinar and, and we will hope that we will see you again uh, in a couple of weeks when we schedule our next meeting. Again, I want to thank you again, uh, Prof. Stalmans, for your time and, uh, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Abdurrahman, for helping out and take care everyone. Stay safe. Thank bye you bye. for the invitation. Thank you, Adil. Thank you, Professor Sam.